Welcome along to the Coaching Corner uh, this Thursday. We are here again, and thanks to the kind and generous support of um, the Phillips team. We also have on the on the wire today um, Elias Jaffa. So we're going to be having a look at methods of telemedicine and having a look at the gadget that he has um, been playing with uh, to help do some telemedicine and in, in low resource settings and stuff. And then I'm going to quickly go over a scan approach for early pregnancy. So I'm going to hand over to Elias. First, we'll introduce him. Elias Jaffa is an emergency physician um, slash hacker slash techno whiz doing lots of different things with technology. He co-founded Global Focus and he is going to talk to us about telemedicine. So go. hi, um, I'm Eli Jaffa. Um, uh, like someone said, I'm, I'm an emergency doc um, in the southeastern United States, uh, currently in South Carolina, previously at Duke in North Carolina, um, mostly originally from up north uh, in New England. And yeah, that was the best description that I could have hoped to uh, to give myself uh, that I'm an emergency physician and a hacker, um, which everybody loves to hear that term and get really upset about it in some ways because uh, they have different uh, thoughts about what a hacker actually is. But in in personal experience, it's really just somebody who likes to uh, take their stuff and make it do stuff it shouldn't be doing otherwise, um, if that makes sense. So uh, in this particular case, I'm an ultrasound nerd. And when I was going through fellowship, um, I managed to uh, get out to Tanzania for about two weeks um, and met with a couple of emergency physicians at uh, KCMC, which is uh, Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center. Um, and uh, they were absolutely incredible. Um, I loved working with them, really bright folks. Um, they did manage to have a, um, uh, a point of care ultrasound device out there, but they uh, didn't have really anybody like locally who was like specifically trained in point of care ultrasound. The guy who's running the emergency uh, department at KCMC was at the time and may still be the, the single uh, like residency trained emergency physician in the northern zone of Tanzania, like half the country, like their catchment areas, like several tens of millions of people, I believe. Um, and he's the only one that's actually had specific training in, in emergency medicine or in ultrasound or anything like that. And so, um, so we were hoping to help out there. And uh, like I was just telling Suan, we, um, after I left, we kept in touch. They would send me uh, clips of their exams or they would call me up on WhatsApp and they would spin the phone around, uh, the camera around and they would show me the screen. And I'd be like, oh, wow, that's like horrifying pathology. And I would like, it's very easy to tell what that is, but if it was any more subtle, like I would really, really have a difficult time seeing it with the source images that they were uh, kind of transmitting that way. So I was like, how can I get images off of those machines live and in real time sent over the wire so that I can see them and I can talk to them and give them feedback. Um, and we can kind of like get a better exam in real time. Um, I think a lot of trainees are aware uh, and a lot of um, educators are aware that like even the, the asynchronicity of like a, uh, someone going in the room, doing an exam, bringing it back out of the room and then reviewing the images right then and there, like, even that small gap is enough to kind of like curtail a lot of the like immediate feedback of like someone staring over your shoulder and giving you real in, in the moment feedback that you can adjust to and then you can learn from that. And then that like, that is the absolute best way in my opinion to, um, um, to, to receive mentorship um, and, and receive training. So, um, so I, I've been working on something that will approximate that uh, as close as I can. And this is the device that I kind of came up with. So, um, yeah, so if anybody out there is familiar with the Raspberry Pi system, um, so let me see if I can get in focus here. Um, this camera, sorry, really likes faces, so it's not gonna really pick it up somehow. Um, but anyway, this is, a, this is a Raspberry Pi device. It's a $25 um, single board computer is what they call them. Um, so uh, everything is included in this little green chip uh, and you can buy them on Amazon for, this one is 25 bucks, this one is, ten dollars um and they can be really powerful depending on how you program them so in this particular case i took a couple of pieces of software that are actually free and open source um so you can go online grab the source code and just do whatever you want with it and so i kind of manipulated it a bit and uh found a couple of these really cheap um frame grabbers um a colleague of mine has a 
platform that he uses a really expensive like Epifan three hundred dollar um, HDMI frame grabber to uh, create three dimensional ultrasounds from two dimensional ones, which is obviously way next level from this. Um, but basically, this is like a twelve dollar grabs video output from S video or or composite or whatever, transforms it into a USB. The software that's running on here. Um, creates a little USB, uh, sorry, a, um, a Wi-Fi network that you can connect to on your phone um, and then bridges that to like an existing Wi-Fi, like your hotspot on your cell phone or whatever else. And that just allows you to like control the device from like a web page that's like got big fancy buttons that say add Wi-Fi or start live stream and just like an easier interface. Um, and then it takes the video output from a machine plugs it through that USB connection, encodes it into a format that's um, more friendly for digital transmission, and then streams it over the internet to a server. And I also have um, uh, a way of setting up a server to receive all those images and display them live. So basically the idea is that you plug it into the computer or into the, um, uh, into the ultrasound machine and actually it'll draw its power directly from the USB plugs on the machine. Um, and just hit a button on your phone and it'll start projecting live images over the internet. It'll record them in real time so that you have like an automatic record of all your streams. Um, and then somebody can log into a website and, uh, and view them live. Uh, at this point, I'd like to apologize for my lack of readiness. I've been actually in the process of updating all the software um, to use a uh, more modern framework so that it's not coupled to software that went out of style like six years ago um and in doing so I, I got it like that close and uh, i realized this morning that it's actually just garbage right now so it's it's in shambles um it's it's it, i had a really robust ecosystem at one point and then like all my ser servers over the last probably two years in the in the messiness of my life over the last couple of years has have just kind of fallen into disrepair um however if anybody's interested out there um my website that i um host most of the information about this on is jaffamd.com. Um, you can also like search for jaffamd on GitHub and that's actually where I host all the files. So I deliberately made these free and open source so that anybody can go and download the files and run the scripts. And I tried to make it as close to idiot proof as possible because a lot of people are terrified by just like bare electronics for some reason. Um, and uh, I wanted that to be like not as much of a barrier. So it's as close to just like you type a couple of things in and then it just runs in the background and creates these devices for you. Um, and you can create the server either on your home computer if you have a little bit of know-how or if you have less, you can rent server space for like five bucks a month and you can host your own server and, and start streaming stuff uh, back and forth and have your colleagues kind of log into it and, and see stuff. So um, that's the general description. Um, this is, I want to point out just one way, just one method that I've kind of played with and I've had more experience with over the last couple of years and it's kind of been my, my pet project, but there's, um, this is a weird time and this is a very interesting time to be interested in telemedicine and telepocus and, and other forms of technology augmenting, especially point of care ultrasound in the COVID era. Mostly, I think it's interesting because of the fact that you've now got a much higher barrier to actually getting in the room, especially for education. And everybody's trying to literally social distance and, and physical distance, I should say. Um, and, uh, and it can be very difficult to get not only proper patient care, but also education as well. Um, and there are, are, whether that's, whether it's just like bridging the gap between the outside of the room and the actual room, or bridging the gap between 6,000 miles between countries. Um, I think there's a role for technology like this and other means to, to facilitate both education and clinical uh, care. So um, uh, that's all I can kind of go off the top of my head. If anybody wants to kind of like uh, poke at a couple, we can talk about a couple of other systems that are available, some commercial things, some uh, less commercial seeming things. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there and, and there's some interesting stuff that can be done. So does your, um, does your website have like the step-by-step? -step? Cause yeah, it's not so it, much the bare, yes. the bare yeah. um, electronics that bother me. It's the, it's the actual like getting into the terminals <laughs> and all that stuff. Yeah. So yeah, let yeah. me, um, let me see if I can manipulate this a little bit. Um, 
just after. Sure. Jeez, that was yeah. way harder than I expected it to be. I apologize for everybody out there. Uh, <laughs> just watching me flounder for minutes on end. Um, so this is the website actually. Um, so jaffmd.com. Um, sorry, we were chatting on Twitter earlier. Uh, so you go here and it just kind of uh, takes you through a couple. This is actually a uh, another piece of software that I made that's just to um, visualize the uh, statistics of your colleagues and so forth if you're on a focus program. Um, that is for another day. So this is, this is mostly information about how the uh, stream box actually works. I actually changed the name recently, the branding to, to the sauna streamer because somehow nobody's actually called anything that. But this walks you through like, why would you do it? How does it work? Um, it's got a little video towards the end of it kind of seeing the uh, actual utility, but this button right up in here is the GitHub symbol and that will actually redirect you to the GitHub repositories. And you can go to the Sano streamer, and uh, this this is a very very nauseatingly detailed uh, account of how to set up every little aspect of it. So this is this is part of how I tried to make it absolutely idiot proof. Like even setting up the server and like creating your usernames and like where to go to get the servers. Like DigitalOcean is a really fantastic uh, company. AWS, Amazon Web Services, uh, Microsoft Azure. There's like a ton of like rent a cloud server basically um and don't be fooled though when they pull it up and you're like create a new server it shows you like the cheapest one is like 40 bucks a month there's a left a left arrow you can get one for five bucks a month and it's like more than enough to handle something like this um these i will say that this is the uh this is the stuff that's kind of out of date and i've got um i haven't actually pushed it to github yet i was hoping to I'm trying to make it even more idiot proof where it's just literally like you dump the file onto the SD card, the micro SD card and you plug it into the Pi, and it just straight up works. Um, and again, that close. Um, so hopefully later this week, so if anybody's interested, you can stop by jeffmd.com and there'll hopefully be an announcement there. Um, and it'll have a big button redirecting you to GitHub um, so that you can start downloading the files and, and playing with this stuff. Um, I haven't gotten to the point of actually like, selling pre-made devices i would thought about that for a little while i haven't really got around to it because i've got a similar stuff going on but <laughs> you know just stuff uh yeah so this is this is how you would find uh all those instructions yeah. Ooh. do you guys have any questions for Elias? hey eli that looks uh, amazing um i would love to give one of those devices a go how, um, so say for example, the person doing the ultrasound has their phone, which they're using as a hotspot. I'm thinking of some places in the Pacific that don't have good um, mobile networks. How, how fast does the mobile network have to be to give you a good live stream? That's a really great question. Um, not super fast. I actually haven't done, I've, I've been, there's literally a line item on my like running to-do list that spans multiple pages on my little pocket notebooks these days um, for like t testing it out and actually seeing what the bandwidth is. Um, depending on your tolerance for quality, it's actually, you can, you can use a fairly slow connection. So I know um, when I was in Tanzania, uh, definitely not the fastest mobile networks, um, maybe 3G-ish around there, like 3G LTE. Um, and uh, it was certainly enough where I could hotspot my phone um, with a Tanzanian um, uh, SIM card. And that, uh, you know, is a little bit of a boost from my slightly higher end phone, but, um, uh, but that was enough to like stream Netflix. And that was, it was the same connection was, was more than enough to stream these types of things. So, so with a, um, and it also varies by the device, right? So like I was using a Sonosite M Turbo, um, which puts out a 640 by 800 at most image uh, pixels. Um, there's a little bit of pixelation that gets in there. And so some of the like super, super, super subtle, like maybe wall motion or if you're trying to do speckle tracking, it's probably not gonna happen. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, if you're willing to tolerate a little bit of glitchiness in the signal, like it, it does pretty good. Um, some of the higher end um, devices like the GE Venue, um, I know does like um, HDMI output. A lot of devices do HDMI output these days. Um, 
and those are going to be obviously just like a larger amount of information being transferred. So yeah, it's going to require a little bit more of a bandwidth, but you can also, the, the cool part about the software is if you go into the, um, uh, into this, the, the coding, you can actually deliberately downcode it. You can actually make it a lower quality in order to, to match the bandwidth. And you can actually do, um, variable rates. Actually, the, the FFmpeg is the, um, is the background software that runs all that audio visual stuff. And it's really, really powerful. It's been around for decades and it's, very robust. Cool. Awesome. Well, when you are ready for some customers, I'll be here. <laughs> I'm happy. I actually sent Ken uh, McDermott a device the other day. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to anything that gets them out there. I've, I've been putting it out there for a while and people expressed interest and like, I can see like, I don't think this is a single person that's actually made one. Um, so I've just been like kind of like seeding a bunch of uh, a bunch of Raspberry Pi devices out there in the middle of nowhere. So uh, so yeah, if you uh, if you hit me up, I uh, I may be able to get you a device anyway. We'll be in touch. Amazing. Yes. All right. So, um, the, one of the things that I've found that um, we get asked quite a lot is just how to tackle the early pregnancy assessment scan, and I think I think the thing that can be lacking a lot of the time is just a. a approach how to how to how to start how to finish where do you what questions do you ask along the way you know it, we, we've got one goal in mind and that's to confirm an intrauterine pregnancy but if things aren't going well then you've got to kind of you know solve the problem as you go along so i thought that we would just um review a few things in early pregnancy and talk about a scanning sequence or approach to the scan so we'll talk first on first of all the uh, normal normal intrauterine pregnancy criteria. So if we look at the very, very earliest that we can see anything on a ultrasound image, about the five weeks mark, you get a, a, a little cystic sac and it should be eccentrically located within the endometrium. So a small, very small round fluid collection surrounded by hyperechoic echogenic rim of uh, tissue. And the echogenic rim of tissue is the reaction of the deciduum and stuff of the endometrium with the black hole being where the pregnancy is going to develop. Now, if you, uh, if you look at this, it can look very much like a pseudo sac. And how do you know the difference? At this point, you don't. So, you know, I can see on this image that there is quite a thickened endometrium. Um, so that's one thing that sort of cues me in that that might be, you know, progressing normally rather than a pseudo sac. So the pseudo sacs often don't have that real thick endometrium appearance. So at five weeks, we see that little cystic space. At five and a half weeks, five weeks, four days is the first time that we'll see the yolk sac. And the yolk sac is the little round structure here. And that is the first thing that will definitely distinguish this from a pseudo sac. So a yolk sac is associated with the intrauterine pregnancy and you just don't get a yolk sac in a pseudo sac of ectopic pregnancy. So you can see uh, here also, we're looking at the double deciduous ring. So you've got the sort of gestational sac here and the reactive endometrial tissue around it. When we look at six weeks, it's like a diamond ring appearance. Um, you get this tiny, tiny little blip of tissue. Sometimes it's like two lines flickering at you um, and you can see the heartbeat, but there's just not so much to look at and, and you know, Patients are always a little bit disappointed. They're pregnant, they're really excited, and then there's just these two little lines winking at you. But um, maybe they'd be more impressed with the diamond ring, I'm not sure. Um, so we can see another one over here, six weeks. To confirm an intrauterine pregnancy, you have to see three things. You have to see an intrauterine gestation with a yolk sac and a fetal pole with a heartbeat. So we can see the fetal pole just here and the yolk sac just here. Sometimes it can look like that yolk sac looks like um, the, the head of the fetus, but uh, it's not and it shouldn't be mistaken for it. And if you go on to measure crown rump length, you're not supposed to, don't include the yolk sac um, because it's a completely separate structure. We have another example here and you can see this one's probably more like seven weeks and you can see the little flickering of the heartbeat there. So to confirm viability, we need to do a fetal heart rate using the M mode uh, to document the heart rhythm. 
The best thing you can do here to improve your pictures is to make sure that you've optimized your image before you put the M mode on. So M mode works so that we have, you pop the, the, M, the motion mode, the M line or the M cursor right through where the uh, fiddle heart is beating. And then, you know, this black stuff here represents as the black stuff over here. So as we go through this, we've got the just uh, the crown rump length here, and that's the tissue that's involved, that is represented by baby. And then the down here, we also have another pulse that you can see here that's reflecting the maternal pulse, which is um, in one of the arcuate arteries of the uterus there. So when you optimize your image, you can see on this picture on the left here, this is taken at a depth of 20 centimeters. And just up here, we can start to see a little bit of motion there. But it's, it's pretty hard, you squint, you kind of, where's the peaks, where's the trough, where do I put my cursor to demonstrate that there is a heartbeat there. But you can also see that all of this tissue, all this stuff at the back here, is not adding any information to the picture. So it's kind of wasted real estate. So if we just decrease our depth, and now we've moved it up to about 10 centimeters or so, and then I've applied the zoom functionality on the system. And now you can see we've actually maximized the, the fetal motion or the movement of the heart. And so now we can actually see nice peaks and troughs and it's much easier to determine where to place the cursors to get and document the fetal heart trace. So that's at a depth of 10 and then zooming the image. So the other, the, the, if you can't see an intrauterine pregnancy, obviously you go on and look for, for signs of ectopic, but um, we also need to establish has the pregnancy, is it an ongoing normal pregnancy? So if we look at the pregnancy failure criteria, they say that on transvaginal exam, if you don't have a fetal heart and a mean sac diameter of over 25 millimetres, you can conclude that the pregnancy has failed. If your crown rump length is bigger than seven millimeters and there's no fetal heart observed for over 30 seconds, then you can conclude that this pregnancy has failed. And the third way that you can um, determine that the pregnancy has failed is if they've had a previous scan and there's been poor or absent growth over one week. So if you don't, if it's a very early pregnancy and you don't see something straight up, you might, uh, you might rebook or reschedule for another scan in seven to ten days and if it's still looking the same well then you can conclude that there's uh that the pregnancy has failed now sometimes you just don't see anything and so that's where we get to the pregnancy of unknown location now this is a a, a sonographic description of nothing's there you know it's not a pathological description and, and what it says is that if you have a patient with a pregnancy test and no definitive signs of an intrauterine pregnancy seen on a transvaginal exam, then you call it a pregnancy of unknown, unknown location until you can prove otherwise. Now, the thing with the pregnancy of unknown location, it could represent three possible outcomes. It might be a very, very early intrauterine pregnancy that is completely normal. We've just caught it soon. It could be an ectopic pregnancy. And they're the ones that we need to be really careful to exclude other signs. If you've got a stable patient and uh, they have an ectopic pregnancy, maybe all you see is, an, is a funny adnexal mass or something, or you might just see nothing in the uterus. So you have to keep following that patient until you can prove that it's either intrauterine or it's elsewhere. And the third option or the third possible outcome of a pregnancy of unknown location is a failed a failed normal pregnancy or a failed pregnancy of unknown location, failed ectopic or failed intrauterine. So how do I go about um, tackling the scan? The, the reason that I do it in this kind of order is I find that it's much easier to kind of, you know, you've, you've often got a patient who's just really, really keen. They're anxious about their, what's going to happen. They might've had some spotting, whatever, they, they want to know, is, is my baby still alive? And that's their, own, their be all and end all question. Um, if I just go in and then go straight to the heartbeat and it's not there, inevitably my body language changes. You know, they know, they pick up on this and then that's pretty much the end of my exam. And there might be other things going on that would be really helpful to know for the clinical management of this patient. So I always start with a really wide 
focus on my scans and then bring the focus in and look at baby last because I find it easier to uh, say to the patient, listen, I've just got to have a quick look at your anatomy, make sure you're okay, and then we'll move on to bub. I'm buying myself time to be able to assess the pregnancy and get all of the answers rather than just diving in straight away and only getting part of the picture. So we start with which probe are we going to use? Uh, you can use the transvaginal or the transabdominal probe, depending on what your protocols are. We'll talk a little bit more about why you choose one or the other in a sec. You want to set up your preset, so you choose your obstetric preset and then pop your patient data in. When you uh, look at the transabdominal versus the transvaginal image, pretty much all of those structures of early pregnancy are seen about a week sooner on a transvaginal image. Now the reason for that, it's a high frequency probe and it's right up against the anatomy. So we get way nicer detail on the uh, transvaginal imaging than we do on transabdominal pictures. And you can do it with an empty bladder, which is really handy sometimes. So here's an example. This is the same pregnancy, five and a half weeks or so transabdominally. And then when we look transvaginally, we can actually differentiate that there's a crown lump length there. So my sequence. Step one, I'm doing a scalp scan. I want to check the surrounds. I want to get the lie of the land. Is it antiverted? Is it retroverted? I want to answer those big life and death questions first. Is there any free fluid in the pouch of Douglas? And can I see any adnexal masses? So this is when I have a good look at the patient's anatomy. I'm trying to see the ovaries. If I can't see the ovaries, well, I'm having a good look through the adnexa. If I can see the ovaries, I'm trying to find which side is the corpus luteum on. Ectopics are much more likely to happen and occur on the same side as the corpus luteum. Not impossible to be the other side, but uh, more likely on the side of the corpus luteum. So if I can find the corpus luteum, I know to check that adnexa really, really carefully. So I start in longitudinal with my probe, the probe marker pointing to the patient's head. And I'm in the midline and I want the heel of the probe or the bottom of the probe hard up against symphysis pubis and pointing the probe directly down to the bed. I sweep from one side of the pelvis to the other. And you can see on this one, we've got ovaries, uterus, and the other ovary on the other side here. And then I do a sweep in transverse. Superior to inferior, inferior to superior, whichever way you go, you wanna make sure you've covered the whole uterus. Specifically looking from cervix, you wanna rule out that there's not something uh, in the cervix, a cervical ectopic or an open cervix in the case of miscarriage. So, the reason I start in long is because the anatomy is easy. The patterns of anatomy in sagittal section, no matter which part of the body we're in, are all very familiar. All the textbooks have all of their drawings and their pictures are represented as a sagittal section, sagittal kidney, sagittal uterus. So the shapes of things are familiar and particularly for the pelvis. If I start in transverse, the bladder can be a black hole and the uterus can be a black hole if my gain settings are not right. And they both look just round structures, which one's which. Um, so if we start in longitudinal, I pop the probe on, as I said, probe marker pointing to the patient's head and I put the bottom or the heel of the probe right up against this, uh, the symphysis pubis and I point the probe directly to the bed, perpendicular to the bed. This works in guys or girls to find free fluid uh, in the retrophysical or the pouch of Douglas. I'm looking to delineate the cervix and vagina complex and that then acts like an arrow, which then points to where the pouch of Douglas is and where I'm gonna expect to see the fluid. So we can see in this picture, the pink tick is like um, looking like a Nike swish or a tick, a check mark. The, the darker pink there is the cervix. The lighter pink is the vaginal stripe. And then we're looking for fluid deep to that cervix vagina complex there. Step two is to focus on the uterus. The questions I'm asking now are, is there an intrauterine pregnancy? Is the cervix opened or closed? How many gestations can I see? And is there any other big pathology like big fibroids or anything else untoward that might ex uh, influence the exit strategy or the exit plan for when baby is ultimately delivered? 
So we're looking at first to confirm an intrauterine pregnancy or not. So if this, if you had an empty uterus, it could be a pregnancy of unknown location unless you specifically visualize an ectopic mass. We're looking at the pouch of Douglas. We've got our, um, our depth set so that it's a couple of centimetres deeper than where we need to be so that we can see the uh, free fluid and the relationship of the organs to each other. I'm also just confirming on this picture that there is an intrauterine gestation and I've scanned through to confirm that there's only one pregnancy. Every now and then you get a bit more than you bargained for and uh, you can see two gestational sacs. Now the, the key thing to rule in, rule out a multiple pregnancy is that you have to scan from lateral to lateral border of the uterus and then inferior to superior so that you're not missing any part of it. Step three, I focus on the gestation. What I'm looking for here is to determine whether the gestational sac is nice and round and smooth and regular. Are there any signs of perigestational bleeding? Can I see the developing placenta? So here's an example of a normal, round, smooth, and, and, it's, and it's round and tense um, gestational sac. Whereas you can get, this is an abnormal one, you can see this ended up being a miscarriage, but there's a lot of um, perigestational bleeding here and a really irregular gestational uh, decidual reaction here. So we can see on the normal, that double decidual ring, and then here as we look around baby's house, for example, it's just not quite smooth and regular. Here's another example of a normal one, nice and round, the nice double decidual ring sign, and here's abnormal. We've got a nice big uh, perigestational bleed here. Now this pregnancy actually went on to be a normal live birth. So you can never tell, there can be quite considerable perigestational bleeds and some mean doom and some mean absolutely nothing at all. Last but not least, I move on to uh, focus on the fetus. From the patient's perspective, this is probably the only thing they want you to look at and they're waiting for this moment when you can you know, confirm that it's viable or not. But as I explained before, I leave this to the end um, so that I've got the whole big picture and I can then uh, service the patient better by getting all the information rather than only some of it. So when we look at the fetus and we focus on the fetus, we need to think about confirming viability. So the first port of call is to then actually document the heart trace. Now this might be via an M mode trace or early on it could be that you are just documenting uh, a video loop that shows where the heart is beating. If I haven't got any of those options, I actually type it on the screen and say FHES or FHNO. Next thing you're looking at, doing your M mode, and then last but not least, uh, dating the pregnancy and, and doing crown rump length or gestational mean sac diameters. So then we move on to a minimum imaging series. I start with a longitudinal of the uterus. I want to make sure that I can see a document that there's something in the uterus, I also want to make sure that I can document that there's no free fluid in the pouch of Douglas. So my depth is set a little bit generously here to make sure that we've captured those things. Have a, a transverse view of the fundus and show that there is a, a fetal pole within the gestational sac, within the fundus of the uterus. I look out and take an image of either the ovaries or the adnexa. If I can't find the ovaries, I call it the adnexa. We then move on to the fetus and document the, we can see on this one picture, we can see a nice smooth decidual reaction and we've got a crown rump length here. We document the fetal heart trace. And last but not least, you wanna capture an image of the reports page. If you don't sort of take a picture and a print screen of the reports page, the information might be in the computer, but you lose that after you end the exam. So you need to actually separately capture an image of the reports page to um, print out or to demonstrate what the average ultrasound age is for the patient. So that's my very quick whirlwind tour of how I approach the first trimester exam. And now it's over to you guys to ask any questions.
So how do you how do you approach your um, your conversations with your patients about the subcortical on camera? Because I actually I was just mentioning in the chat that I I honestly don't even bring it up with most of my patients unless they ask about it specifically, like like hey, what's that big dark thing? Um, mostly just because it is like I mean, in my experience, it's been like you say, like kind of prognostically difficult to, to explain or even to understand for us. Never mind for from a patient's perspective, you know. So I, I didn't know if you had like scripting or if you had like more of yeah. a Look, I think um, early pregnancy communication for me has been uh, an area that I have very early in the in the piece I concentrated on. My, I didn't do too much pregnancy ultrasound in my training. And so then the next place I went was a women's hospital. And on the first day of work, I had four miscarriages in a row. So previously it was, um, you know, you must not tell it, the patient anything. And they opened the x-ray envelope in the car park with the report in it. And then at the next workplace, it was like, no, no, we've done a whole lot of research. And the way the patients handle things better is if the person who finds these things, it has a better impact on the grieving process, et cetera, et cetera. And I was completely unprepared for that. So I did quite a lot of, you know, studying what do the doctors say when they tell a patient bad news or whatever. Um, the, where I've got to, if it's a peridistational bleed, like you say, the prognostic value is not always as predictive as you'd like it to be. Um, if the patient doesn't ask any questions, I don't say much. If the patient says stuff about bleeding and I've seen a bit of a, a peridistational bleed, I'll say something like there's, it looks like there's a bruise on the uterus that can mean good things, it can mean bad things. Often it's like a bruise on your shin. Your body takes care of it over time. And if we scan you in a couple of weeks time, it's gone. But yeah, I kind of am led by the patient. If they're asking questions, I always personally, I don't, I try to be as direct as I can within the scope of my practice um, and, and to be as honest as I can without overstepping any sort of political boundaries and upsetting too many of the radiologists, whatever. Um, but I, I, I try to be as honest as I can and direct as I can. So if it's just a little bit, it might, ex sometimes they feel like they need to understand that there's actually a reason for their spotting. And, and so when I have explained it as, you know, it's like a little bruise, there's no known reason why it's not anything you've done or sometimes this happens. Some people have this the whole way through pregnancy. Some people it means, you know, if you had frank red bleeding, you need to go back to the doctor if it's just dry brown stuff, you're probably you're probably going to be fine. That actually matches up with my approach pretty darn closely, and actually also takes into account my approach to like early vaginal bleeding in pregnancy, <laughs> like because it's like yeah, it's like fifty fifty. It's like you know, um, but anyway, yeah. Thank you. Cool. Does anyone else have any questions? Do you do anything different than that, Daniela? Um, no, same. I probably wouldn't tell them there was any bleeding there, but it depends on how many questions they ask. So, you know, if they if they ask, try and be um, mindful about how you word it, but and try and be brief in how you explain it. But yeah, otherwise, no, I wouldn't tell them. I find that um, my first port of call is to try and hedge my bets, and and it's interesting when we've been teaching obstetricians. Um, Sonographers are very good at putting it off and not answering the question because we're not supposed to and it's not our job technically. So we get very good at, you know, trying to push it back and, and let them ask the doctor. Um, and we can, we can kind of hide behind that a little bit, if you like, to sort of say, look, this might be a question you better talk about with your doctor. And depending on who the referring clinicians are, you know, some are very precious about these things and some are happy um, that you've dealt with it. Um, when we've been teaching the obstetricians, and, and I think even in an emergency context, you, you can't hide behind the fact that you push this off necessarily. Um, they, they're used to asking questions of you and for you to have an answer. So if you're doing a scan, they're kind of expecting an answer on the spot. And so you need to know how to do this. The, um, if you are going to hedge your bets, you've got to hedge your bets before you start scanning and pre-warn the patient that... I might not be able to find out all the answers today. You may still indeed need a formal scan and I might be able to see as clearly they've got better machines, call it whatever you like. But you have to do that hedging your bets before you actually start the scan because otherwise it looks like you're avoiding stuff. Um, so you have to kind of frame it right, not just dump a minute, so to speak. 
Yeah, it's fine. I actually do that, exactly that. So I, I most of like I usually like approach it as like, hey, like don't worry about like me not chatting with you. Like I'm just gonna grab some pictures. I'm gonna take a look again. I like turn the screen away from them so it's not like quite as obvious. And then I can like kind of like spend a little more time. Like you know maybe it's just me. Maybe it's my image quality. Maybe it's you know some patient factor or whatever. Um, but actually, I have uh, I think my one of the first days I was on my intern rotation for um for my ultrasound block uh didn't my like my first ob scan and it was i was like rapidly diagnosed her with twins and then rapidly diagnosed her with like both like double fetal loss um and like i was saved by like the transporter taking her out to to the radiology scan but um but yeah no it's uh it's uh the poker face is very real um and it, and it it's it develops very quickly with uh with I think a lot of me and my colleagues, but um, but yeah, I was, I was really interested in your thoughts. I think that um, certainly when I'm teaching sonographers, but it's also relevant for clinicians who are training. It, I think it's really, really important to have an exit strategy going in. You've got to set up, set the scene and have an exit strategy and a way to get out of trouble um, and, and have that ready and, and in place before you find stuff. Um, Sometimes the poker face can work for you and sometimes it can work against you. I've had a, I had one, my biggest fear as a sonographer was finding at a 18 week scan, finding an anencephalic baby. And I had rehearsed that so much in my head. Here's how I'm going to handle it. Cause I had a, a fellow student who had um, found one. She completely freaked out, went into the radiologist to say, Oh my God, this is happening. And he said, well, how many weeks is it? And she's like, I don't know. I just found that there was, there was no fetal, um, head structures and you know and then she got wrapped over the knuckle so I, I had that in my mind and so the first time I did find an anencephalic baby I had rehearsed the poker face so much that it worked against me because then the patient was shocked that oh this scan had been going so well because my face had been so straight and they had no sense that there was something coming so the poker face can work for and against you and I think it's it's just really important to be mindful that it isn't, it isn't just the ultrasound picture talking. Your face tells a story. Your body language tells a story. And you have to be conscious of that as you're dealing with these kind of cases. Well, cool. I think then um, if, if anyone, if no one has any more questions, I'm going to throw it out there and challenge everyone for some, uh, uh, to send me some questions for next week. Um, Otherwise, I'm going to come up with a couple of ideas. But uh, it'd be great if some people could send some questions through for next week. And uh, we've got uh, Eli, Eli's uh, Twitter handle here and the website there that you can go and check out his stream box. And the other thing I'd just like to acknowledge once again, the generous support of Philips in bringing the coaching corner to you. And hopefully we can see you tuning in Next week, same bat time, same bat station, half past seven Eastern Standard Time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Eli. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Appreciate it, guys.